Okay, I'm ready. Hello. Hi. I'm going to talk about the Pearl Admin Calendar from last year, the 2017 edition. So, history of the Pearl Admin Calendar. I mentioned this briefly yesterday, but I'll mention it again for all of you that were asleep. Um, we went to the pub, where all good ideas or bad ideas, as the case may be, happen. Uh, the day before Advent, uh, so on the uh, end of November, and we said, oh, tomorrow we're talking about getting, opening our Advent calendars and getting chocolates like we did when we were kids. And I said, wouldn't it be good if you got a pearl module every day for Advent? So when I woke up the next day, I, uh, that memory stayed with me, and I started writing the Pearl Advent calendar. And that was 18 years ago. And since then, a few things have changed. Uh, I've had people help me write it. I've had people help me organize it and take over organizing it until I could take it back again when I was busy. And la last year, like the first two years, I wrote all the articles myself, which means that I was very, very busy. Uh, but it does mean that I can give a talk like this. But quick aside, this year I don't want to write all the articles myself. So if you would all like to go to here and submit proposals for advent, cal for advent calendar articles for next year, no matter what your ability or your, we're, we're going to help you edit them. We're going, if you're not an English speaker, then I will especially help you with the English and the so forth. And hopefully I won't be so busy this Christmas. But let's go back briefly. Um, so this, what is this talk? This is talk is a brief summary of the 2017 Advent calendar. I've given several similar talks over the years at Pearl conferences, and they have one thing in common. They mean that I have to talk very, very quickly. Uh, let me see, there, I've got 24 uh, days to talk about. I've been speaking for one minute and 56 seconds so far, which gives me about two minutes to talk about each day. So the idea here is to expose you to the concepts in the Pearl Advent Calendar. And if you want to know more, and you probably will, then go read the full article, because I've written an article on each one of these things, uh, which is available at pearladvent.org 2017. So I'm running out of time, so I'm going to jump straight in. Day one, I started to talk about emoji which are, are popular in, in lots of places, not just uh, bad movies with people that got kicked out of HBO's Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, who likes emojis? Why, Father Christmas likes emojis, because he's got his very own character. One, two, seven, eight, seven, seven. Father Christmas. And uh, outputting the emoji in Pearl is fairly straightforward. You, uh, of course, need to have a UTF-8 output to use high-bit characters. And you then can just use this exceedingly memorable um, hex code to print out with an uh, slash x escape sequence. So 1F386. Thanks you for all your hard work tonight. Me, Father Christmas thanking his elves. Of course, it's quite easy to make a typo. If, you, if I'd have said 1F386, then we'd have had the Easter Bunny thanking everybody for their, for their hard work. Not so good. So let's do something different. Let's turn UTF-8 mode on in our source code. So uh, we can t put UTF-8 directly in our source. And then we can just uh, put in the Father Christmas emoji copy and pasting from where you get your characters from. Um, this, I see people looking scared at the idea of putting UTF-8 in their source code and what that might mean. So let's not do that either. Let's use the slash N, which you can use in, very mo in modern pearls or slightly older pearls if you uh, enable the right features, and the name of the character, and say Father Christmas. I kept talking about emojis for more than one day because they're so awesome. <laughs> uh, OK, the, the point was that there was an ellipsis there was still UTF-8. If we point out all the errors in the slide, this is going to take longer than 50 minutes. Um, so I kept talking about emojis in day two. Uh, the multi-character emojis, you know, multi-byte for UTF-8, multi-characters for each glyph. So the glyph is the thing you see. So uh, you could have a letter and then in the acute character, and they combine to make one glyph. Or you can have an emoji, and you can change the skin tone, or you can change the gender with different things. Or you can, you know, make flags out of various characters. Uh, typically, for example, for the United States, because you can tell by my American accent, that that's where I live, um, the original indicator letter U and original indicator symbol letter S, when combined, form the American flag. Or this is Pearl, so there's a Pearl module for it. Ah, uh, so onto the third day, I started started talking about context. Now, context in Pearl, as you know, is list context or scalar context, and various things do different things depending on the context you call them in. For example, here. Uh, we're, I'm using DBIX class, the uh, standard uh, 
uh, database abstraction. And when I search for something, if I call it in scalar context, I get a result set object back, which I can call next, 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 on and to get all of the results. Or I can call it in list context and just get all the results back. But this can cause problems, right? So here's a moose construct, uh, moose attribute builder, which uh, goes here, pulls out a result set for all the naughty children that Santa Claus won't be delivering to, and all the nice children that Santa Claus will be delivering to. Well, actually, it doesn't, because we're calling it in this context. Oops. So this is what happens, which is not at all what we want, and it potentially is a security risk. So let's not do that. Let's instead change this to be result uh, search RS, which always returns the result set. Much better. In fact, this search stuff in this context is so dangerous that let's not ever do it. And this brings me on to the next part of the article, which was talking about writing your own Perl critic rule to exclude particular method calls, which is something that they do at the North Pole and the place I work also. So here's a quick Perl critic rule. I won't go and explain every single little bit of it, but you can see basically uh, what its severity is highest. There's a, its uh, default theme is the North Pole. You can specify different themes that you'll be using in Perl critic. And you can s and see that I'm looking at uh, for PPI tokens words. In fact, I'm looking for things that are method calls using the handy is method call. So <laughs> by the time we get to the bottom here, if its, if its name is search and it is a method call, we're going to disallow it unless you uh, uh, skip this in your scores code. Uh, moving on, here docs. Uh, I talked about here docs, which are a really common and old thing in Perl, but they've changed. They've changed a bit. So uh, let's talk a little quick about here docs so that for people that don't know what they are. You know, you get a bunch of of strings and concatenate them together, which is a bit messy. So you can replace it with this here doc terminator syntax, and you have you get the end, and it includes this is the string of everything down to the end. And of course, we can put syntax highlighting on in modern editors by calling it something that the editor will recognize, like SQL or various other languages, and that tells us that I can't. So here, and that tells us I can't type here, and we can we we fix that. Uh, the other thing we can do, of course, is uh, by default, uh, here docs are escaped. S and, uh, sorry, require, are uh, interpolated, so they interpolate strings into them. So I'm here, I'm escaping the slash one, which I need to pass through to the DBI layer. S but I can fix, fix that by putting quotes around it. And now we don't have to escape it. What's new in, uh, with uh, here docs, however, is this thing. So here we have a here doc terminator right the way on the left-hand side where it has to be, which doesn't match all the indentation of everything else, but new in Perl 5.2.6, we can add this little extra tilde in here, which says, delete all the white space before the, the corresponding white space before the here doc terminator, which means we can indent this. Awesome. Another thing that's is handy with, um, that is a handy tool to use with here docs are the, is the baby cart syntax. The Okay, so Book, Philippe, created these names for these virtual Perl operators which allow you to do things by combining existing Perl operators. And he named this one the baby cart operator after a uh, kung fu character that walked around pushing a baby cart. But anyway, what it allows you to do is embed Perl code in the middle of a quoted string. So here you can see that I'm using it to access a named attribute on an object. Now, this isn't particularly useful here because I'm saying there's more stuff here than if I'd have just escaped out of the string. But where it is useful is in those here docs. So here are some literal th strings that I want to interpolate right in the middle of my here doc, and I can use the baby cart operator to do that. Hmm. North Pole safety precautions. Oh, this was a good one. How do you start your Pole scripts? You know, we start there with use strings and use warnings, right? We, most of us use no indirect because we don't like the indirect method context. And we turn off multidimensional because who wants Perl's pseudo multidimensional arrays when we can just use references? And we should probably turn auto die on because, you know, we want to catch errors and UTF-8 so we can put emojis of file the Christmas in our, in our source code. And we want say because say is awesome. And we definitely want experimental features like signatures because even though they're experimental, they're so cool and that we've been waiting for them for, I don't know, 25 years. So, and then we also, okay, there's a lot of stuff going at the beginning of our Perl script now. I don't want a page and a half of, of includes before I actually get to the point where I'm going to be using, uh, writing some code. So at the North Pole, they use one statement, which is use North Pole 
ARPO, which is their in-house declaration for use everything the way we agreed to in our corporate meetings. And how that works is it uses a module called Import Into. So uh, this is the inside of the North Pole, mod uh, North Pole ARPO module. And you can see here, oh, you can't see my cursor. Oh, well, OK. Here you can see the uh, we're importing strict into our callers namespace. We're importing warners, warnings into our imp uh, namespace. And let's, of course, discuss post -ref de de deref signatures, all of the new features, because, hey, we're crazy and we love them. And with this, you can build up your own very own kind of use strict bringer in a <laughs> It's a technical term. Sorry? Policy module. Now, bring it in. It is a much better name than policy module. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there are Perl. There are more than way thing, may, one way to do things. Choices, choices. So many choices. Okay. So one of my go-to modules for when I'm writing a command line utility is the uh, term choose module, which saves me having to put a zillion command line options in there, which everyone hates. So making it interactive. Um, it's a very simple module which allows you to pick an option from the command line. So you just literally get a, a choose subroutine, and, and you specify a list and what the prompt is, and it returns either undeath if you hit escape, or returns the thing that you selected with enter. It's quite clever in the fact that it can go ahead and uh, cope with multiple screen loads of stuff, so it will handle the uh, pagination for you. And you can pick your favorite Christmas movie on it, which is, of course, uh, uh, let me see, uh, Muppet Christmas Carol, okay. And it also allows to do multiple choices. So uh, let's see here. Uh, if I just hit return, it will give me a one option, but if I hit space, since, and then hit return, it gives me multiple. And uh, again, this is a use of Perl context, so you see that in the code below, I'm choosing in, in this context rather than scalar. <coughs> Constants talked about constants in the Perl article. Um, so some things we want to be variable. The number of pies Santa Claus eats, in a, eats at Christmas goes up and up and up. But other things we want to be constant. We don't, there are three wise men, not two, not four. If we accidentally increase the number of wise men, we want Perl to throw an exception. Uh, so one way to do that, the old traditional way to do that, is to use a subroutine which returns a simple value. And here I'm using a prototype, so I don't need to put the, bra the brackets after every time I call it. And when you have something like this, this here, wise men, will be replaced by the value from the subroutine, or be replaced by three. And we can actually see that. So if you ever wonder what pull actually sees when you type a source code, you can use the bdparse module, like so, to get your source code back again. And you can see here, pull actually saw, well, when it's been compiled and turned into optrees, pull actually saw the three there. But actually, don't do this because this sucks. Because as soon as you have anything complicated, Perl can't inline that anymore. So we can use constant, except that also sucks because here we have I'm escaping out of the string, I'm escaping into the string. Uh, I'd rather just be able to have uh, strings interpolated. And don't even get me started about trying to use this as hash keys, which would automatically be treated as strings for you. No, 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 that's terrible. terrible. So. What are we use instead is a module called const fast. Now, Perl actually has a constant flag which it associates with every scalar, one of the many little tiny flags inside each scalar, uh, which detects whether Perl is allowed to change the contents of that scalar or not. This is normally used by Perl for um, when you have literal strings and it's reusing them in multiple places and it doesn't want you to change them because it would change multiple places and break everything. But using this uh, const fast, you can set it on various variables. So you see I'm declaring a constant with const my wise one, and then I'm giving it a value, and that value will never change. You can also assign data structures to this, and the value, those data structures all the way down won't be allowed to change. You won't be able to add things to arrays or add keys to the hashes. And that gives you uh, constants that work. And they also they work very, very fast. They work at the same speed as anything else, any uh, normal uh, scalar which you would otherwise be able to change. I'm going to talk now about regular expressions, because we haven't had a long enough tutorial on those today. Um, so I was going to talk about uh, uh, this ability for Perl to have defined blocks. Did we know you could define regular have defined blocks? So I create this defined block here, and then I pick 
a name for a chunk of regular expressions. And rather than that being used there, I, it's a name that can be reused in various places in my regular expression. So I can reuse chunks of the regular expression. And here I'm using it to match Merkle bought gold, or gold was bought by Merkle. I assume that's how to pronounce his unpronounceable name. Anyway, you can do really quite complicated things with that. Here is a grammar for uh, variables and uh, expressions which can create a bracketed uh, numeric expression with plus, minus, multiplications, uh, and so forth. And it's recursive grammar, which refers back to itself. So a, a th expression is a thing, or a thing in an operator in an expression, which can go back to a thing, and so forth. And you can get these arbitrary complicated uh, things, which you would normally need a recursive descent parser to, to do this. And a, a traditional regular expression cannot match that, as we all learned in CompSci 101. Um, but Perl is, of course, way more powerful. So let's simplify this grammar. This grammar now is, uh, is actually much more readable, but it's the same thing, just with a little bit of Perl sprinkled in. And with that little bit of Perl sprinkled in, we can directly port it over to a regular expression. And this regular expression is now recursive, and, can, and you can call back to previous things that you've defined. And now I can match whether I, this a arbitrary complicated nested data structure matches a grammar. Wow. Didn't know I could do that until a, a year ago. OK, once you've got that grammar, the next day I wanted to turn that into Perl code, which is fairly straightforward. It's a little bit of su substitution of, uh, uh, here and there. And then, of course, you uh, compile that. And in Perl, you compile things by running the, through a string eval. And string eval is really powerful. And string eval has uh, not only can turn in Perl code uh, uh, strings into Perl code, but it also allows that Perl code to access variables in lexical scope. So in this example here, the function that is returned from this has access to the splines var uh, variables that have been reticulated. Uh, but the trouble is it also has anything access to anything else in lex lexical scope as well. So the Perl code has access to the self here, which is maybe not what we meant and can lead to weird and crazy b bugs. So there's a module to avoid that. It's called a vowel closure, and it allows me to specify not only what the source is, but the exact environment I'm allowed to access from that source. And this is used in the guts of Moose to do all those th nice things that Moose allows us to do. I also wanted to talk about Path Tiny, because there are many abstractions on, on top of the file system, and Path Tiny is a tiny one that does most of what I want. Um, so it exports this this path function, which I can use and call and chuck in uh, various uh, string paths in, and it knows how to combine them. It will do the right thing if we happen to have a, be running on a system where the slash goes the other way, like Windows. Um, and But it also allows us to, what it returns is an object which you can call methods on, or it will stringify to do things so it will look like a normal path. So for example, that object I could open a file handle to to read, to write or even open to uh, read, uh, to write in UTF with UTF-8 mode enabled. And if there was a problem, it'll throw an exception. And this is all the code. We don't need the open. We don't need or the or die. We don't need any of that stuff. But also, for a tiny module, it can do other cool things like, I don't know, uh, append to a file, making sure you flock it first so you're the only one that's appending to it. Uh, or it can mutate each line on a file with a callback and a whole bunch of other stuff. I'll let you dive into the documentation for that. By day 12, I was getting a little bit more introspective, and I wanted to answer some harder questions. So I, I wanted to ask, who's been eating all my memory? Have you, have you ever had a Perl program which has just churned away memory? And like, I don't know what's going on. Well, there's a module for that. It's called DevelMat, and it gives you the PMAT uh, shell, which allows you to, to basically go and look through a map of Perl memory and call you know, a whole list of commands on it that I'll describe very briefly in a second. But you're probably wondering, wait, wait, how do I get one of those memory maps? Well, you have a Perl program that, I don't know, creates a five gig data str uh, string in it, and then you die. And when you die, you ha run your, when, if you run your program with this handy yellow string here, which is almost unviewable, but you know what I mean, it will, in, it will instrument your Perl in such a way that when it dies, it dumps out a memory map. And then you can load it into PMAP from the command line and do things like, say, what was the largest thing in here? And look, there is our five gig scalar. And uh, of course, we all know what 0x7f8, yeah, no, we don't know what that is. So we have to ask 
pmap for it, and it will tell us it's the in the main code lexical dollar elf at depth one is a scalar. And if you, you've got something slightly more complicated, like this, this is structure here, we get something like inside Santa's workshop at the lexical elf. There is a value uh, attribute with a, uh, and that, and in there there's a mood, and then the, and that is our scalar. So you can see how you can get at those things. Of course, what happens if we don't have a huge scalar? We have a huge data structure, like this recursively built data structure, which gets very large. Um, well, if I ask PMAP for the largest, it's going to say I, there wasn't really anything particularly large there. But what I can do is ask it to use dash dash owned and say, recursively go from count up these things very slowly, yeah, but it will get there. And then I can see that uh, the lexical here that I'm identifying is uh, the big data structure. The other kind of thing that tends to chew up our memory is a memory leak. So this is a reference counting error here where I am referring back to the same thing and that will never be garbage collected. And those are really hard to find because you have lots of tiny, tiny small things. Um, one thing you can do is you have a suspect if you suspect that this isn't being garbage collected, is ask uh, Devel Maps to search for every, all the strings in it and find all of the things which had the string Merry Christmas. And as I can see, there's hundreds and hundreds of these. That probably means I'm leaking memory. Uh, word of warning, we all know this, but we all forget this, that the uh, keys to hashes are not proper Perl scalars. They are references to Perl scalars. So if I search for this data, I will only ever find one of them because that's what was declared when I the hard-coded scalar, which was declared in the source code. So you, you want to search for things within the, the values, not within the keys. I need a break. <laughs> I'm talking too much. Okay, everyone tell me what that is. You don't know. Okay. That <laughs> Correct. The, the title's a bit of a giveaway. Let's ask Pearl. Okay, so we'll split it, uh, we're, and then we'll pipe pass each one into uh, char names via code. OK, and that spits out Bengal Bengali digit 1 and Bengali digit 2. So that's really that with different characters. It would be nice if Perl could give us some number back, which we can, you, know, you could add these things together. If I tried treating that as a number, Perl's just going to treat it as 0. But there is a module for that. It's Unicode UCD. And Unicode UCD has so many cool things in it. But one of the things it can do is uh, translate things that are kind of numbers into numbers. Uh, on day 14, I started talking about uh, prereqs. So you have various prereqs that you need to make sure are installed so that your code works. How do you find those? How do you know what it is? Well, you can keep track as you go, but we're lazy and we never do that. So uh, one of the things you can do is hook at ink. At ink is where you list all of the places that Perl should try and load modules from. And one of the things you can put in there is a subroutine that Perl will try to load the module from. Uh, and if that returns false, it will just go on to the next thing. So one of the things we can do is have it print out to standard error what the name of the module we were looking for and return false so it always moves on. And then we can just load it up and run our code and compile, uh, sorry, not run our code. We can compile our code and we'll get a list of all of the modules that we use. Now there are problems with that. We'll not only get the list of all the modules we're going to, we're using, but all of the modules that the modules we use uh, using, which I guess gives us a full prerequisite list, but also gives us a lot of stuff to specify. Um, so, what are the other issues? It's totally unsafe. Do not try this on code because it is actually executing stuff that, if it's code that you do not know what's in there, all hell will break loose and potentially, you know, delete your machine. Your code's got to compile. So you, uh, obviously, most of our code compiles, but it might not compile on the development machine you're using, or it might require something that isn't installed. And it gives you out these weird file name paths uh, that are platform dependent and are not ex the colon colon syntax we're all used to. So there's a lot of issues with this approach. CPAN to the rescue. So instead of executing the source code, we can parse it with one of many modules. Here are three that I looked at and like the look of. Um, there's Perl prerequisite scanner, which <coughs> you pass in the name of the file to scan, and it passes you back a bunch of requirements as a hash reference and this works with Perl uh, um, the more traditional kind and it also works with Moose and it's based on PPI so it will parse it somewhat slowly. The faster option is Perl Prereq Scanner Lite which does basically the same thing except with 
much faster hard-coded XS. How much faster? Well, smaller is better on this. You know, it, you, get, you can basically scan four times as many modules with, with, uh, with light than with the standard non-light version. Oh, and there's a, there's in a wonderful name, naming scheme choice, there's Perl prereq scanner, not quite light, <coughs> which will also go and find optional dependencies for you too. And that does that by going inside the bell string code and looking for things which look like depend, uh, dependencies in there too. It's not foolproof, none of this is, but it's pretty darn good. On day 15. Because I can't type. <coughs> I cannot remember off the top of my head. Luckily, I wrote an article. So the question was, which one of these two is it? Is it not quite light? or not so light. And I think it's not quite light, but I can't remember. <laughs> okay, the, the, uh, my, my eager beaver helpers at the back have told me it is not quite, uh, quite light. I can't remember this. Christmas was a long time ago now. Okay, Mojilicious on the command line. This was one of my favorite uh, articles to write. Uh, so this is talking about Ojo. Was it called Ojo? because you can use it from Perl by typing Perl dash M Ojo dash Mojo. <coughs> and what it does is it exports a bunch of, um, of single character subroutines which do awesome things. Uh, so GHPTU allow you to do get, hit, post, patch, and put requests. Uh, R is a data dumper shortcut. J turns J, uh, string into uh, parses a uh, string and turns it into a da JSON data structure, or takes a JSON data structure and turns it back into a string. F gives you a Mojo file instance, which is kind of like Path Tiny, the kind of same thing we just talked about. C and C creates this Mojo collection, which is a fancy OO array. Demonstration time, using an API which worked at Christmas, but Google have since deprecated. But anyway, demonstration time. Uh, here I am getting the, the latest as of the time per weekly article, and I am doing a, uh, running a DOM selector against it, which will return a Mojolicious collection. And this, what I'm selecting here using CSS is all of the uh, links on all of the titles for the entries. And then I'm running it through a map, which runs through this subroutine, and joining the result. So what does the subroutine do? Well, it does a put request the P for put, and it grabs out of the, uh, the thing in the collection, which is the uh, DOM object, the href, the link, and sends it as JSON to the Google URL for the Google URL shortener. And then we pass the result back as JSON and use a JSON path to say we want the ID back. And then we uh, join it all together, print it out, and at the terminal I get a list of all the, of the uh, all of the articles with links and the titles, so I can quickly click and come through them. <coughs> On day 16, I started a brief sojourn off into some Moose modules that everyone likes and wants to know more about. Uh, and I started with Moose X attribute shortcuts. So imagine we have a object which re represents Santa's sleigh, and of course, Santa's sleigh needs reindeers to pull it, and there is a lead reindeer, a second reindeer, a third reindeer, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on and so on. So you have a lots of these code. And all of these reindeers are built automatically. So they're lazy, they are, and they have a builder. And the builder is, corresponds to the same name as the attribute itself. So the lead reindeer is built by build, build lead reindeer. The second reindeer is built by build second reindeer, and so on and so on and so on. And so you end up with a lot of code. Uh, so let's talk about attribute shorten. First of all, in this, oh, where are we? oh, there we go. <laughs> and so we can shorten this all down into one quick set of code. So here we're using the multiple attribute version of uh, uh, multiple attribute declaration version of Moose, which is standard. But what we've changed is we've added this is lazy. So instead of having to specify it's read only, it's lazy, and uh, the name of the builder is. We just say is lazy, and uh, Moose will automatically determine the name of the builder from the name of the uh, of the attribute. We've also made use of is it instance of, so we don't have to do that class type declaration on everything. But that's just one thing that attribute shorten can do for us. 
there are many, many things that I am not going to list because it takes too long, but I'm going to list a couple more, which are, for example, uh, inline type declaration. So this is a quick way to define Santa's reindeer with a glowing nose, which is any reindeer with a glowing nose that can lead Santa's sleigh. And uh, you can, as you can see, it's, this, it's a class type uh, which is the same as Santa's reindeer, except it's got this extra inline code here to check for a glowing nose. Awesome. That is a lot of typing. Um, so with attribute shorten, we could do this. We can just pass a subroutine if it an, uh, uh, is a, which is a one-off quick type declaration. So it's the same as Santa's reindeer. It's got a glowing nose. Or better, we could keep the instance of Santa's, rein Santa's reindeer, and then we could add an extra constraint on the end, or multiple constraints. But in this case, just the one, because we just care if it's a glowing nose. Um, another useful uh, moose extension is strict constructor. OK, so. Uh, Robbie, the reindeer, Santa, um, which is Rudolph's son, is obviously taking over for him because Rudolph's getting on a bit. So we're going to specify a lead reindeer here and not let the default builder work. And that won't work. And that won't work because I cannot type that a lead reindeer. No, 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 no. So but traditionally, Moose does not complain about this. Moose just ignores the attributes and lets it go. And the default constructor will, uh, the default builder will fire, and poor old Rudolph will be brought out of retirement to ride the sleigh. So we can fix that with Moose X strict constructor, which will throw an exception if it does not recognize the attribute. That was quick and easy. A little bit more confusing is Moose class X attribute, which allows us to define class attributes. <coughs> so let's consider a uh, reindeer sleigh again. And uh, so let's consider the reindeers. And they, they eat carrots. And they have this method uh, where it's called eat food, and they eat the carrot. Um, but we need to keep track of all the carrots. Now, where do we keep track of those? Well, one option is to keep this information inside the reindeer class itself as a class attribute. So here we have a, a class attribute, a class has rather than a has. And uh, now this, the value of this attribute is shared amongst all of the reindeer, not just the one reindeer. But it is a true class attribute. It's a true attribute. So we can do things like add traits to it. So we can give it the counter trait and make it handles carrots eaten. And suddenly, the eat food subroutine becomes a lot easier to write because we can just have Moose do all of the work for us. Now, I'd like to talk about maybes on day 19. Maybes. Maybe, maybe not. OK. So maybe is sometimes considered code smell in, in Moose. Here's a um, part of the. Uh, Santa's sleigh code, and he has a GPS unit, or he doesn't. Some models of sleigh have it, some models of don't. And so we define this class, we define this instance method, a GPS unit, as a maybe class type GPS unit. So it might be an def, or it might be something of the GPS unit class. But the trouble is, then every time we want to access it, we need to go and say, a look at the uh, if the GPS unit returned is defined before we use it. So an alternative is to use a predicate. So we can ask uh, Moose to specify a predicate to say, have we set this or not? And then we can say, if basic slay has GPS unit. Much better. But there's still a problem. If we accidentally call GPS unit without checking if it, we had it or not, it will still return undef. So that's not so good, because that could, we could copy that variable, and it could be moved several times before we actually use it and explode at a far away point. What we want to do is immediately go bang as soon as we try and access something that doesn't exist. Well, that's what most lazy, uh, lazy required does. We bring it in, and we specify that uh, this attribute has a lazy require. It's required, but, you don't, but only if you try and access it. Uh, another reason people use maybe is because of this kind of thing, where they want to, they may have a GPS unit to pass in, or they may not have a GPS unit to pass in. So uh, in this case, if I'm passing in undef, and I have not defined it as maybe, it's going to explode, which is not so good. So we can obviously fix that with a quick ternary, which makes our code horrible and unreadable. Or we can use something like undef tolerant attribute, which allows us to apply a trait to our um, a trait to our attribute, which says that it's undef tolerant. If you pass in an undef as a parameter, then just pretend you never passed it in the first place. Now, I've been talking a l about a lot of. Uh, different moose extensions. Just the same way as I talked about a lot of stuff before in my, what was it, Amari? In my policy module. Yeah, OK, that is good. OK, in my policy module, wouldn't it be nice if we had a similar kind of 
policy module for moose? Well, we have reindeer, which is moose, but with more antlers. I did not name this. I blame Chris. Um, so it's an opinionated version of moose. Mo uh, moose with all of the add-ons we just discussed, plus a lot more, plus a lot more. And it basically you gives you a very powerful version of moose just by saying use reindeer. Now, I'm not advocating that this is exactly necessarily the module that your company may want to use, but it's a very good place to go and take a look at and understand how to build your own one of these. How are we doing? Okay, we need to keep talking. Uh, where are we? Day 21. This is, we're going to slow, okay, slow here. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about DBIX class. So, let's talk about turning a database into a DBIX schema. So, imagine we already have a database, uh, you know, children and presents and stocking addresses and all of those kind of things, and we want to turn it into a database. Well, Perl can do that, uh, turn that into a schema for our database for DBIX class. Well, Perl, Perl can do that for us with a, uh, with a DBIX dump. And that will dump, when we execute it, it will do a, it will dump a, a manual schema, uh, the, a bunch of code out into our lib directory. And then we can see we have all of these files. And we can actually go in and edit these files. As long as we don't touch the bits that were generated by dbic dump, we can add our usual extra methods and uh, extra relations and all of the other nice goodnesses that we want to add to a dbx class. And when we, re if we regenerate it, it will only change the bits it generated and not overwrite our code, which is pretty awesome. The article actually went much further. It talked about generating and uh, populating the database from JSON schemas and so forth, and in a very small font that you will never read, so I'm going to say go read the article. Uh, but one of the things I did like to show on this is that it would, how it talked about how we look into our databases is something that we can do with the reply shell. I don't know who, how many of you have used reply before, but it's basically a run, evaluate, print loop show, i.e. you type something, something happens, you can type more, something else happens. And you can use this very nicely with Dybbuk. Uh, here, so here we have a, sorry for the slight small font, but you can see here I'm exploring my database here and learning all about Macaulay Culkins and his desires for what he wants for uh, Christmas. And uh, this allows us to run around and see how our abstraction layer works. One caveat, you may want to start returning one at the end of certain things where you're going to get a DIBIC result back because if you dump that screen, your screen will fill up with stuff very, very quickly. Um, next, I wanted to talk to you about custom relationships with, with DBIX class. Uh, one of the things that, uh, let, m let me explain a bit. Let's generate a, a, a quick database table, the reason table. So um, Santa is out there, he's delivering presents left, right, and center, but problems happen, and they have to keep track of these problems. And the reason the pros problem doesn't exist, so it might be, I don't know, the slippery tiles on the roof, and they need to go back with super sticky boots, or there's a dog barking, or something like that. So we create a database table called reason, and we give it a, and it has a child UID, which refers back to the child table, it's the foreign key for that, that, that uh, for the child. And then there's a tag, it's just some text which it gives you a reason, so it might say slippery or dog or something along those lines. And then when we regenerate our Dubik schema, it starts, it adds this has many relationships, so a into the child uh, class. So the child has many uh, children, as has many ch child has many reasons uh, why things might go wrong. And then we can add into our child class, we can start adding extra special code. So if we want to say, was there a delivery problem with the dog? Well, this is the code that we can insert in there that goes off and searches for related reasons with the tag dog. And if there's something back, it returns true. If there's nothing there, and if there's, we didn't get anything back, we return false. And then we can call that and solve our problem by feeding the dog bacon. Um, so one of the things that we can do with reply is we before we use it, we can turn on dibic trace equals one, which will tell class, um, DBIX class to classes to dump out the SQL it's using, which is really useful when you want to try and work out what the heck is going on here, or why is this running so slowly, or any number of d uh, hard to debug problems. And here we can see a problem. Here we can see when we first find our child with the, uh, this ID, we get it, it runs some SQL. And then when we ask if there's a delivery problem with the dog, it executes another set of SQL. 
to uh, try and uh, bring back the, all of the reasons that have the dog tag. But if we're doing this for every child on Earth, this is going to get expensive. So how about instead we see if we can make DBIAX class a little smarter? One of the reasons, ways to do that is to take out the custom code that we've written. And we can teach uh, DB, uh, DBIAX class how to uh, understand the relationship. So this is a, a DBIAX class custom relationship and you can s uh, and basically you're building teaching it the arbitrary SQL it, uh, the relationship it needs to understand so here I'm saying that it, as before it's a foreign relationship between the child ID in one table and the child ID in another but I'm also saying that the tag must equal the dog and this is a little confusing a little hard to understand but it's in the documentation uh, but once I've done that I can hopefully get back a much simpler, uh, uh, sorry, a much more complicated but only one set of SQL serotons. And the way I can do that is by using this prefetch thing here. I'm telling, find me this and prefetch the delivery problem with dog relationship. And the SQL that's generated out, it creates a join and that put in there. And you see when I, then now when I do the delivery problem with dog question later on, our code uh, doesn't need to go back to the database because it's already cached inside Perl. Our penultimate module is PRAM's validation compiler, which is a validation compiler. So it validates uh, modules which come in. Uh, so by the way, inside modules, it validates the parameters that come into a subroutine. And there are lots of uh, those out there, but they all tend to be pretty slow. Uh, PRAM's validation compiler is, is faster than most. Even at doing complicated things like going off and you using moose types and type tiny types, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So how does it get that kind of speed? Well, it breaks the validation stuff into two steps essentially. Firstly, we have a validation routine that is compiled, hence the name, Prams Validation Compiler. It compiles a custom, very fast subroutine for us. Um, once what, what that does is. It, just as we saw earlier with the avail closure, which it uses under the hood, it builds a, s a particular subroutine for this particular module, which happens once, and once only at compile time. And then you can see the second arrow points at where we're using that subroutine reference. And with that is used each and every time as quick. And uh, return, and you can do complicated things in here. So you can specify a type. This is a moose type uh, that it must match. We've got uh, below there's a uh, <coughs> default value that goes in there. And it returns us back a list of, of name value pairs that can be cast to a hash, which we can use below. Or if we don't like that, we can also ask it to use a named list. So, uh, so uh, and when we do this, the, we get things back in the order we specified above. So we, the first thing returned is the present name, the second thing is the, the quantity, and we have much faster access. And on the last thing, that we wanted, I wanted to talk to you about was, of course, the summer vacation for the poor people working for Christmas, including myself. And the wise old elf, of course, is going to go to the beach for his summer vacation and sit there and learn more about Pearl because that's what the wise old elf does. And he wants to keep download all the videos from last year's um, Pearl conference, uh, which I'm, of course, getting euro of those. It's just a trivial matter of just grabbing out the various uh, CSS stuff from the uh, YouTube page and we get a link to all of the videos. And downloading a video is simple because we have www YouTube Downloader, which provides the YouTube download file uh, utility. And of course, that and that stuck together with xargs downloads all the videos, which means that Santa Claus and everyone can relax. Five minutes of questions. So, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? I do not have sweets to throw to people that uh, give good questions. Yes. So the question was, was I going to do another advent calendar this year? Yes, there has been an advent calendar for the last 18 years and undoubtedly there will be one next year as well. Though I would appreciate some help as previous years, there is a, now a call for participation at this URL here, cfp.perladvent.org where I would like people to come and write Pearl Advent articles 
or rather submit proposals of pull advent calendar articles. They don't have to be particularly well thought out. They don't have to, you don't have to have a clear idea just yet. Uh, we also do tend to do a lot of editing on your, on your articles. So if you don't think that you're going to be able to necessarily uh, bring lot articles which are of the quality of other articles on that, you won't be the first person. In fact, the articles that we came up weren't all of that quality on, in the first draft. And I would like to encourage people that don't necessarily speak English as their first language to also give it a try. And we will help with the copy editing, though I yes, find that you guys speak English a lot better than I speak whatever languages that you brought up with, but uh, we will help with our very best. Yes? Does it have to be on a module, or could you run an article about a specific part of the language, like the SDG, rather than that specific question? Ah, that's a good question. So the question was, does it have to be on a module, or can it be about particular aspects of a language, or presumably something else? So traditionally, we've, we've done things on modules, but we branched out several years ago to do features. If you noticed, I wrote something on uh, using defined statements in regular expressions, which, of course, are not a module. I was almost breaking my own rule at the time, but uh, as more and more interesting stuff became available in Perl, there was more and more interesting stuff to write about in Perl. Uh, any further questions? I do not see any hands, or, or if you are hands up, they're very low. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Oh, one last question. Does it have to be at a specific level? Oh, so the question... Okay, so the question was, are the pull art, do the pull advent calendars have to be at any particular level? No, they don't. In fact, that's one of the reasons I'm writing about here docs and other things. There's, I like to keep it, uh, some stuff that is very advanced, some stuff that is very easy, and some stuff that appeals to, to everybody that's, that's using it. And yes, DBIX class gymnastics is really quite advanced, but how to dump a database out into a schema is not. And you can see that there's a range of possibilities from each of those and something for that uh, hopefully a novice will find interesting, and something there that somebody who has uh, been programming Perl for 20 years might also find interesting. Okay, I think that's actually out of time, so thank you everybody. <laughs>